Good evening, everyone. We will start the um, town council meeting for Monday, January 13th. Um, roll call show that all councilors are present. Agenda review. Uh, we have one item that needs to be added to the council agenda. Uh, uh, order 20-18. So I'll take a motion to add that to the agenda. I move to add it to the agenda. Second. All right. Um, all those in favor of adding it to the agenda? Passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll take that up in new business. Uh, moving on to approval of minutes of December 9th, 2019. I'll take a motion, please. Move approval. And a second. All right. Uh, anybody have any questions, concerns, comments? I, I, I did see one interesting correction to be made. Okay. <laughs> um, Nancy demoted our police chief <gasps> to Captain Ewing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We will get I that will fix fixed. That. <laughs> oh, no. uh, <laughs> she'll fix that right away, Josh. Oh, you see him. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any questions, comments, corrections? Hearing none, I'll take a vote on approval of the minutes. All those in favor? Passes unanimously. Moving on to public hearings. Public hearing A to consider a Vichler's license for Global Montello Group Corp doing business as Alltown, 103 Park Street. Dave. Hi, good evening folks. I'm Dave Milan of the Office of Community Development and I'm here to inform you that all of the inspections have been completed, that the personal property taxes and sewer fees are current and staff recommends approval of the license. Thank you. Uh, does anyone wish to speak for or against the issuing of this license? All right. Hearing none, I will close public hearing A. Move on to public hearing B. To consider a Vichler's license for DMCP LLC doing business as Dunkin' Donuts, 103 Park Street. Okay. All inspections have been completed. Personal property tax and sewer fees are current and staff recommends approval of the license. Thank you. Uh, anyone wish to speak for or against the issuing of this license? Hearing none, I'll close public hearing B. Move on to public hearing C to consider a class 1A malt, spirituous, and vinous li hotel liquor license, special amusement permit for music, dancing, and entertainment, and vitulers license for University Inn oh. Academic Suites, 5 College Avenue. Dave? Uh, no surprise, all inspections have been completed. Uh, personal property taxes and sewer fees are current, and staff recommends approval of the license. All right. Anyone wish to speak for or against the issuing of this license? Hearing none, I will close public hearing C. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Move on to public hearing D. To consider an expansion of the Village Commercial Zoning District to convert 85, 87, 88, and 92 Main Street from medium density residential to Village Commercial. My name is Kyle Drexler, I'm the town planner. Uh, so the image there that you're seeing is our zoning map um, with the four properties in question highlighted in the uh, slashed pink color. So the, the pink area is our village commercial uh, downtown area um, and the yellow is medium density residential. So the area we're talking about expanding here is along Main Street um, around uh, Juniper Street. So what prompted this uh, beginning was really uh, Alpenglow, which is business located at 92 Main Street, um, looking to uh, go from a home business, which they are now, to a uh, fully uh, operational commercial retail store um, which allows a number of kind of expansions to their business functions. Uh, it allows for more signage, more employees, um, using more floor space of their existing structures for the business, um, all sorts of things like that that a home business uh, has more restrictions on. 
Um, so with any potential zoning change, uh, you can look at either changing the zoning map or doing a contract zone that's specific to one lot. Um, but because in this case, uh, the lot where Alpen Glow is located was so close to our existing village commercial, um, and there was also uh, some village commercial lots right across the street from where 92 Main Street is located. Um, we thought it made more sense to simply extend the village commercial um, down those couple lots uh, to meet 92 Main Street. So in total, there's the four lots that would turn into village commercial. Um, most of them, the, the size of those lots is more closely related to our minimum lot size in the village commercial anyway. Um, our medium density residential minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet. Um, these lots here are in the 2,500 to 6,000 square foot range, uh, except for the lot where Alpen Glow is located. But so those three lots currently are legally non-conforming lots in the MDR. So by making those village commercial lots, they become conforming lots. Um, should also be noted, and it was noted through the, the planning board process, uh, the public hearing there, that the village commercial isn't only for commercial uses. Uh, the village commercial also allows um, all sorts of residential uses from single family homes to multifamily structures. Uh, so with any zoning change, uh, we had to look to the comprehensive plan to make sure that the goals of the comprehensive plan were being met by the change we were looking to make. And uh, there are a number of areas that the comp plan points to uh, that really, I think, support uh, the idea of this. Uh, one is to grow the downtown in a compact, walkable manner, building on its village architecture. Another, encouraging mixed uses, including residences in the downtown area. Village commercial is probably the most mixed use of all of our districts. Um, and last, creating opportunities for affordable home ownership close to services and jobs. Um, so again, by allowing denser, higher densities and potential for two family homes instead of single family homes, you're creating more opportunities for uh, maybe not home ownership in all cases, but uh, opportunity for a rental to go in or, you know, something that wouldn't be able to go in uh, in the medium density residential district. Uh, so. This idea went to the planning board for public hearing. Um, it received a couple of public comments there. Um, just some talking about um, already having uh, commercial space in the town. Um, but I think that as the home existing home business that we're talking about is an established business in this location, it made sense more to build on its current uh, location and support them there. A couple other potential impacts you know, that might be thought of with this expansion is the idea of uh, commercial uses then going into a uh, residential area on Juniper or Myrtle Street um, as 92 Main Street sort of backs onto those uh, streets as well. Um, so what we've done is to kind of cut 92 Main Street have the front half of it be village commercial and the back half be medium density residential. Um, that way no commercial uses can go in fronting on Juniper or Myrtle Street, um, you know, kind of changing the character of that neighborhood. Um, you know, Alpenglow would really be limited to their existing structure fronting on Main Street as the only uh, viable commercial um, opportunity on the lot. Um, and the last thing to note was that uh, 88 and 92 Main Street are currently part of our um, Main Street uh, overlay district, uh, which provides a number of standards and guidelines for preserving the historic character of those buildings. Um, by putting them into the village commercial, they are then taken out of that overlay district. However, uh, those lots are still part of the National Historic Register of Historic Places. Um, so they're still protected from a historic preservation standpoint uh, through that process. So if 
either of those lots wanted to do any sort of structural changes to their lots, they would be required to send the plans to the main preservation, uh, historic preservation committee, um, which would then comment on the changes and whoever the reviewing party in the town was, whether the code officer or the planning board, would then be able to take uh, the historic preservation committee's comments into consideration and make their determination then. Um, so we really felt like we uh, addressed the potential impacts and were left with the benefits of, of the change. Um, Kyle, just process. This, will, this is a public hearing. It will come back to council one more time before we take the vote next meet month. It's, I don't didn't see it on the agenda. I believe this was the... So it's been to planning board. It's yep. now here. Yep. We normally would take a brief stop at um, workshop and if there are comments. Um, if it, it's not being voted on tonight as well. No, saying. it's a land use change, Cindy. So it has to go one. Right. That's can't you can't do it tonight. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Yes, Lori. Thank you. That was an excellent description, and perhaps I missed it. But the little sliver across the street, from my understanding of our town, that's just the driveway, isn't it? No, there's two small lots in between the existing village commercial and... Oh, those are private homes. Okay. Yeah, they're okay. two single family homes. Two, they're, okay. they're, they're not, it looks so small, it looks like a driveway, but I really, yeah. now I, yes, it's two homes, one behind the next. Yeah. So they those are, are uh, it's pretty small lots though. So that was, I was talking about those lots. One is 2,600 square feet and the other is 5,000 square Oh yeah, you did feet. mention that. So, okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it fits more into the village commercial. Thank you. All right, I, you're set, Kyle. I'll take public comment. Does anyone wish to speak regarding this matter? Hearing none, I will close public hearing D and move on to public hearing E to consider ordinance amendments to the Town of Orono Ordinances, Chapter 18, Land Use, Section 18-152, Mobile Food Vendors to Implement Standards for Mobile home vendors and related sections. Okay. okay. So the uh, idea of this ordinance amendment was to create a uh, use for mobile food vendors, uh, which are most commonly referred to as food trucks, but it could be uh, any motorized vehicle or object towed by a motorized vehicle. Um, so it could be food trucks, trailers, that sort of thing. Um, that's preparing uh, or selling food items. So currently these uh, types of things when they've come forward before have been permitted as a restaurant and no matter um, you know, where it's proposed or how long they propose could just be for a day, it would have to go through the site plan approval process through the planning board and you know advertise for a public hearing. Um, and it just seemed uh, a pretty burdensome process for something that could be for a very limited period of time. So the idea with this ordinance amendment was to create uh, a kind of tiered system where you have a, a mobile food vendor one and a mobile food vendor two. Um, so if you're operating on non-consecutive days, a few days, you wanted to test out a location or you wanted to come for uh, a single event in town, you could simply uh, as a mobile food vendor, you could get a permit through the code office and not have to go through the, the planning board process. Um, but then if you were going to operate on more of a permanent basis for consecutive days, or you were going to um, you know, go to the same restaurant parking lot every weekend uh, throughout the whole year, uh, that would require you to go through site plan approval. Um, and this just gives a few performance standards specific to mobile food vendors um, that weren't in the ordinance because a use like this uh, wasn't in existence. So uh, things, you know, just accessibility things, um, since usually they would be put uh, in existing business parking areas, uh, making sure that those parking minimums were still met, making sure people still had access in and out, emergency service vehicles still had access in and out, uh, things like that. So that was the general idea of the ordinance, uh, really just 
covering a, a lapse in our current ordinance. Great. Um, does anyone wish to comment on this ordinance? All right. Hearing none, I will close public hearing E. Thank you, Kyle. And we'll move on to acknowledgments by council members. Terry, you'll start your end. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to um, remind our um, citizens of um, to, to visit the Facebook site for the town. It continuously provides us updates of what, what's current, what's going on, um, and what's happening around our community. Um, having said that, reminder that by the end of January the 31st, you must have your uh, dog's licenses um, renewed to avoid a $25 fine. So just a reminder to everybody out there with, with those, uh, with dogs. Thank you, Jay. Sure. Um, this might be the first year I haven't paid $25. <laughs> I did get my dog licensed. Um, I just wanna say um, welcome to the first meeting of the new decade, yes. 2020. And also, that was my first thing, um, I, I was reminded um, this afternoon that uh, Connie Carter is taking donations um, to help support Farmer's Market and Asa Adams. And um, I believe there's a website that you can go to and maybe somebody knows more about that. So thank you, that's it. Megan. Well, I would just like to remind folks that well, we got a handy handout so I don't even have to look at my own notes. Um, January 28th will be the candidates night for Orono Town Council and school board elections. Um, so please do come on January 28th at 7 p.m. Um, and and <laughs> grill grill us live. Uh, <laughs> you know, that'll be great. Um, or you can also call in with your questions at 889-6905, or you can email them to info at orno.org. So many different ways that you can participate. So please do. Thanks. Tom. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge Laura Mitchell, who conducted what I thought was a very worthwhile professional development workshop for the town council last week. You're shaking your head. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I want to thank Orno for, for uh, me getting to do this job. I think it's a one, wonderful group I get to work with. And we did have a great training on Thursday uh, at, where we learned about how to communicate better to do our jobs better. So I think uh, I feel very lucky to be part of this group and to, that we're constantly trying to do a better job for the town. I also had the opportunity to attend training on Saturday and Sunday with Progressive Governance Academy. Uh, there were town people representing towns from around the state, like Bitterford and Hallowell and South Portland and Portland. Uh, and we were talking about how we can do our jobs better for our towns. So that was a great opportunity that came through my inbox as a town counselor. Do you want to do this? I said, sure. Anyway, so I'm really, really grateful to be able to serve and I hope that anyone in town, when you're looking at us on the overhead or when you want to email us, contact us and tell us what you'd like us to do and how you want to see Orno be different or better. Thanks a lot. Tom, have I, one I, I did have another one. I oh, remembered. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I would like to acknowledge Frederica Smith, an Orono resident who has been volunteering for some time in the town office working on organizing vital statistics. Um, I've been in there three or four times in the last two weeks. She's there every time I go in. It's like, uh, it's like she's a regular employee and she's volunteering her services. So I really appreciate that. And I'd like the council to uh, send her a note of thanks and appreciation. Uh, Sam. Uh, she'll, she and Paul will also be moderating the uh, panels night too. Correct. Which is great. So uh, they just, they can't get enough of 59 Main Street, can they? Um, no, you guys covered it all. Happy New Year. Get your dog registered. Um, I would like to just point out a few things that were on our consent agenda. Um, March 3rd is the presidential primary and and then March 10th is the annual municipal election. So there's two elections within a week. There will be information on how to possibly absentee ballot 
on the third for the tenth, uh, but you can't do it on the tenth for the third. <laughs> and um, and also uh, we are looking at proclaiming the month of March as Science Month in the town of Orono. With that, I will take a um, motion to pass the consent agenda, order 20-01. Oh, excuse me, just the consent agenda, not the whole. So moved. Second, please. Second. All right, all those in favor of the consent agenda? Passes unanimously. Through the pages. Moving on to new business order 20 14, order accepting the FY19 Town of Orono financial audit. I'll take a motion, please. Move approval. All right. Sophie, you're up. So let me say yes, you can be shocked that it's January and we're having this presentation. Um, I will say, um, all kidding aside, that um, my staff did a really nice job preparing for the audit this year, which is what's allowed it to go so smoothly and for us to have the fin financial statements so early. It's my understanding we have Connie um, Thorne here, who is our finance manager. It's my understanding she's going to learn how to do this, so this should be my last presentation <laughs> of the audit. So... Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, first to let people know that counselors have in fact had the audit for a little bit of time and have reviewed it. Um, but to give folks some background, um, state law requires that all municipalities complete an annual post audit of financial statements by a certified public accountant. They have a list of people. Um, Council engaged Runyon, Kirstein, and Ouellette of South Portland this year. This will be the fifth year that, um, that they have worked for us. Um, so management's job, and in this case I'm management, my job is to work um, with the auditor to facilitate the audit process. I have to create portions of the um, financial statements. However, the auditor actually works for the town council. So if you have questions that I'm not answering, you should feel free to let Cindy and Tom know. So the audit is actually um, a multi-part um, report. It has the independent auditor report at the beginning. The next section is management discussion and analysis. And if, that's, if you're only going to read one part of the audit, I would ask you to read those eight pages that Connie and I slaved over. Um, those eight pages give you a, um, in real lay language, um, a general snapshot of what the audit is trying to say. Um, <clears throat> after that, there are lists of um, a series of basic financial statements, which are really helpful if you also read the accompanying notes that go with them. So that narrative is actually kind of important. Then it goes on to the required supplementary information, and I kind of pull that aside because a lot of that information goes into a deep dive on our pension liability and the other benefits, uh, post-employment benefits, liability that we might have. And then at the end, because we all like to see things differently, we ask them to put together a series of um, financial combined and individual fund um, financial statements that are the ones that, quite honestly, we use um, frequently as the to help support council dis discussions about our finances. So um, we cover um, general governmental and um, business type activities for um, the year ending June 30, 2019. So this is for all the government activi activities and WPCF, which is a separate fund. I am responsible for the preparation and presentation of the financial statements. The auditor is responsible for expressing an opinion on them, so reviewing them and expressing an opinion. And I will get to the very end of the, I'll blow the mystery right now and let you know that he had an unqualified opinion that it was a clean audit.
So, in Orono, we have three different types of funds. Our governmental funds, the largest of which is our general fund, and I think that's where council's most used to operating in. That's what's funded with tax dollars. <clears throat> um, we also have business type activities. Sometimes we'll refer to that as, as the proprietary fund. It's our sewer activities, and it's run more like a private business in terms of the reporting. And then we have special funds. That would be our tax increment financing districts, our special revenues, and um, grants would be part of that. So um, the audit takes several statements and notes to talk about net position. Um, the statement of net position presents information on all of the town's assets, our deferred outflows of resources, liabilities, and deferred inflows of um, resources. The difference between them is the net position. So if we were gonna do a math problem, it would look like this. Total assets plus deferred outlo outflow of resources minus the total liabilities plus the def deferred inflow of, li of resources. So when we think about assets and liabilities, we're reporting them for the period of the report. They're, they are relevant to the period that's being reported on, so FY19. Deferred inflows and outflows means just that. It's a known liability or asset, but it's not being recognized for this period, which is why when you look at the audit, depending on what they're talking about, the numbers can shift because some of the time they're looking at those deferred inflows and outflows and some of the time they're not. Make sense? Yep. If you only knew it took me a half the day to think about how I was gonna explain that. So when we think of the net position of governmental, so right now we're simply dividing it the work, the funds are either governmental or WPCF, one of the two. So um, when you look at the net position for our governmental funds, it actually increased by $1,293,575 to $12,935,598. This would be an increase of about 3% over last year. I have a graph there that shows the increase over time. Um, the lowest number is 10 million on the um, vertical axis. The highest number is 14 million to give you a sense. So um, we've got a U there. Um, it's also very interesting to note that 37% of the town's net position is available to be used to meet the town's ongoing obligations to our citizens or our creditors. So that's, that's pretty good. When we look at that net position, that $12 million, we want to look at um, the difference between what is a net investment in our capital assets versus what is um, not capital related. So this, this chart right here just breaks that down. So we have about um, $6.8 million that's um, net investment in capital assets. We have $1.6 million that's restricted. Restricted means that it's limited or directed by an outside agency. So it's not something that the town council can control. And unrestricted, we have $4.4 million. So I wanted to tell you right now, this does not mean that we have $12.9 million of cash. I wish. So the net investment actually increased by uh, $611,563, or 9.8%. Um, this was actually um, a, a factor created, created by a couple of different things. First, we had an increase of $780,715, which uh, was related to the um, difference in the repayment of notes and capital leases that exceeded 
the note proceeds netted. So we retired more debt than we brought on, which is always a good thing. Um, our restricted um, decrease by $41,282 or 2.5% and our unrestricted increase by $723,294 or 19.4%. A lot of that unrestricted increase is related to um, the way in which we're looking at our pension. So again, not our cash. So on the business type activities or WPCF, our net position decreased by $360,435 to $4,922,191. That is a decrease of 4.8% from FY18. The um, <clears throat> largest reason for this is that we are we our annual depreciation on the plant is far exceeding our annual capital investment or savings of funds. That's where that comes from. So we have um, an annual depreciation of approximately $600,000 a year. And we are, we're not keeping up with that. Excuse me. When you say keeping up, you're saying that we invest to repair the infrastructure but we're repairing less in infrastructure than it's depreciating? Yes. But we, we, hear, we hear about it when it needs work and it doesn't, you're saying it doesn't, it doesn't need work, that's why we're not putting any money into it. Oh, I don't think Joe would, would agree with it doesn't need work. I think that what we've done is come up with a balance of we continue to invest. The, the issue is that um, at the beginning of a rate structure, you have, um, you're putting aside much more. And then as it comes out, as, as time lapses, the increased cost of doing business, the debt, the things of that nature, um, in, reduce the amount that you can set aside. So um, for example, when I got here, we were setting aside 50 and $60,000 a year. This past year, I think we set aside 20. So, um, when you consider that we're setting aside 20 and we're using 200, we're going to eat away at that. So um, this is a situation where the cost of operating and it's our, our infrastructure is aging. You know, where we invested eight million dollars in the plant and um, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and it's it's aging. So um, you ready for me to continue? Okay. So um, the net, when you look at that number, you see that the um, net investment in capital assets decreased by $120,545 over last year, or 4.2%, and unrestricted decrease by 239890 or 10%. That's where you see that um, we're not putting it, we're eating our, our fund balance. So I show this slide every year and um, it always confuses us because we do not show, we budget WPCF like any other town department we do not budget it like a proprietary fund. Never have here. Um, but what that means is that um, our depreciation is shown in our operating expenses. So we brought in $1.4 million in operating revenue in FY19. We um, had $1.5 million of um, operating expenses, which included depreciation. The non-operating revenue is actually an expense for us um, because that's where the auditor shows our $250,000 of interest expense. We show that in the budget. They show it here. Um, 
But you'll notice we had um, almost $52,000 of interest income. So the money that we do have is working for us, which is good. So the total change in net position across all funds, so governmental and business-like, was, was a gain of uh, $933,000 this year. Um, and 37, like I said, 37% of our um, net position is available. Council likes to look at the budgetary stuff. This is where we see that we, um, just looking at the general fund, um, we collected $17,242,416 in total revenues. That was up 3.4% from last year. And it exceeded our budget by $258,000 or 1.57%. When we look at what made up that change, we um, had an increase in revenue sharing beyond the budget. And as you recall, revenue sharing is a percent of what's actually brought in. So the state did better, which meant that we did better than what we budgeted. Um, state grants and reimbursements. Uh, we had $36,000 of uh, reimbursements from other law enforcement agencies for police officers that left our employee and went to theirs. Um, we didn't bring in the money that we had anticipated for contract assessing because that our assessor um, left. And we, were, uh, we brought in about $42,000 less of taxes than we anticipated. When we look at expenditures, we expensed um, $16,619,433. We were under budget by $1.68 million or 9.2%. That looks like a lot until you take into consideration that 893,608% of that was for projects that had already been started in FY19, um, but we carried the money forward because the bills got paid in, in FY20. So um, when we look, uh, what we see is that um, we actually um, had $782,000 that was not carried forward, which is 4.3 of the budgeted amount. We see um, the under budget, the largest um, centers or cost centers that were um, under expensed would be in the assessor's department, which would be based on the fact that we had the reval project that we carried some of those funds forward, um, but also staff transition. Uh, we uh, assess overlay, which we use for tax abatements, and we expect to have a large um, amount remaining at the end of the year. We had about $104,000 there last year. This year, we're probably not going to have that kind of money left there. General Public Works uh, was about $30,000 underspent. And then, of course, all of the capital projects that were in progress. So our largest revenue um, by far is property taxes. We assessed in FY19 a little over $13 million of property taxes for collection. Um, this was an increase of $462,946 over FY18. We um, collected $461,221 more in FY19 than we did in FY18. We had um, $8,920 more outstanding at year end. So we, have, we had $264,670 outstanding at the end of the year, less than $10,000 more than the previous year. And exactly the same collection rate, 97.99. So on to Councillor Perry's favorite part, part, 
let's talk about fund balance. So fund balance is actually comprised of four different categories. The first is non-spendable, which is was $14,295 at year end for us. That's inventory. We have um, gas and diesel in inventory that we buy in bulk. That's an asset. Um, we had $1,643,491 in restricted. And if you hang tight, I have a, a slide to talk about that. We have um, $4,520,229 in assigned. Um, that assignment I also can talk about in a few minutes. The unassigned is $2,028,472. Um, All of that unassigned is in the general fund, just so you're aware. When we look at the total fund balance that is allocated to the general fund, which again is where you guys tend to like to look the most, um, is $7,562,166. So let's go back and talk about that restricted fund balance. Of that $1 million, $1.6 million, $999,171 is, is um, tax increment financing development program funds. So we have six TIF districts. Each one of those districts has a very... Um, specific development program that's been approved by the state. The funds that are sheltered and get put there can only be used for those purposes. And um, most of the time the town council creates purposes that look like um, taking care of debt payments for uh, projects that would uh, create an environment for economic development. So we just, we've done a lot with parking lots for example, in the downtown TIF. Um, we have used it to improve infrastructure. So everything from lighting to roads to sidewalks, um, capital infrastructure programs, they can only be done in the TIF, in the individual TIF districts for economic development purposes. So that's how we fund our economic development department. It's how we do marketing and, and things like that. It's also how we fund the Black Bear Express, which is a sizable um, amount of money. So we actually um, decreased the amount of money in those development programs by $73,947 uh, or 6.9%. I'm going to just give a cautionary flag for council that you're aware that the Mill Street redo is got paid in FY. 20, not in FY19. So that's $200,000 more that's not in the funds. So the other funds are restricted by forces beyond the town council's control. So their grants, the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund, which by state law can only be used for that purpose. Um, you'll see a fund called the Public Library. Those are actually not funds within the town's control. However, because of the way the town utilizes um, the trustees, you're still responsible for reporting the money that's under the control of the trustees. Um, and we still have a little bit of money left from the library construction. So in total, those other funds account for $644,320, which is an increase of $32,665 or 5.3%. So when we talk about assigned fund balance, um, these are assignments that the town council has made. You have made them, you can change them, which you did this past year. Um, and um, so that $4.5 million is an increase of about $2.7 million or 148%, which begs an explanation. Um, 
At the end of last year, we had a new field auditor. And um, when we got the draft financial statements, he did not just automatically pick up the one, almost $2 million that we had been carrying as an assigned fund balance. So last year, we saw a significant decrease in, un in assigned fund balance and an increase, decrease in ass assigned and a corresponding increase in unassigned. Um, that Those funds were dollars that had um, come in from as payment by the Orono Economic Development Corporation when they sold the building at 3 Godfrey Drive. That is a building that the town actually paid to have constructed and took bonds out to have that building constructed. Um, when they sold the building, they gave us all the money to repay the bonds. The bonds could not be prepaid. So we've been holding that money. By the time we got the draft financial statements last year, we did not want to go through the process of restating them. So that's why we came back mid-year at council and asked you to formally assign that $1.9 million. Next year, FY21, is, the, is when the balloon payment is due, and all of that money will be spent. Not the 4.5, but the 1.991. Um, and then the remainder of the increase was due to council's rebalancing of fund balance in um, FY19. So we did a good job of putting money in to reserves for future ex um, expenditures. But you also saw, for example, um, the equipment reserve, capital equipment reserve was getting very low and you put um, $200,000 more in there. So I think I have provided what council asked me to talk about. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'm sure that Tom is going to comment about the excellent job done in the course <laughs> of, the, of the audit, which he knows more about than I. But I, I did just want to, um, you know, point out that our humble town manager, um, that we, we were given a, a report that, <laughs> that says significant deficiencies. It just says none, and it's a blank page, which is always a great thing to receive. Um, and also that the only minor comment that the auditors had was just basically a difference between how our software works and how people's salaries are calculated. So um, I, the, the audit was stellar this year. So Congratulations to our to our town manager and staff. Yeah. And not to disappoint Megan, um, <laughs> Cindy and I both had an opportunity to meet with the auditors when they were here during their work, which we regularly do. As I, I do as chairman of the finance committee, and Cindy does as chair of the of the council. Um, and they were very complimentary about the quality of the information they received and the job that our finance staff was doing, and I'd just like to make that public. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anyone else have any questions, comments? What? You can't question the audience. Well, no, what I'm going to say is how much I appreciated the questions and um, comments I've been getting from uh, the council to better understand the audit. That's been really nice. I've heard from several people. Thank you. All right, with all of that, I will take a vote on Order 20-14. All those in favor of accepting the FY 2019 Town of Orono Financial Audit passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to Order 20-15, order granting the town manager the discretion to offer on a case-by-case -case basis a si signing bonus of up to $10,000 to newly hired police officers who have obtained Maine Criminal Justice Academy basic law enforcement certification prior to hi hire with such bonus to be paid in 260 <laughs> weekly installments. Take a motion, please. Move approval. Okay. So the one thing I want to say that is my mistake 
is that my assumption is when we say certification that the waiver of certification is also acceptable. And that would be for somebody who was trained in another state and proved to the Criminal Justice Academy that they met the standard, they would get a waiver. We would see that as certification there. Now. Hey, good evening. <laughs> I was dared to introduce myself as Captain Ewing, <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, um, so, oh, all right, $10,000 sounds like a lot of money. We've done this for, I think since 2013, and it's only happened twice. Both of those officers are still with us, so maybe that had a little bit of an incentive for them to come and hopefully a little bit more incentive for them to stay. The It's done over five years, so it's not a $10,000 lump sum that's handed to the officer. They're, it's weekly installments, $2,000 a year for, for the five years. So in the event that someone was to separate from us, they haven't been given all that money up front. Um, but it does beg the question, I'm here asking for money for recruitment, and you're, you've seen the ads in the on Facebook and other places that we're trying to hire people and retain people. And, kind of want to talk about the kind of the current state of affairs both nationally and here in Orono. Um, and we're no different than the national trends. So for 20 years, I took a little time today and listed off every name I could think of who has left since I've started. And I, and I may have missed some, I don't believe I did, but I, I hit 38. So 38 people in 20 years. So essentially two people a year leave the agency. And I don't think that that's uncommon for every agency. Um, so looking at the, where they went and what happened to them, half of them went to another agency or are in some um, capacity still in law enforcement. And about a quarter of them, now less, just less than a quarter, are out of law enforcement entirely. So I it just, it was fucked today that I found this Police Executive Research Forum. I don't know if you've heard of PERF before. They do all sorts of research on use of force, hiring, recruitment, and all sorts of trends with law enforcement. And in, in September, they put out the workforce crisis and what police agencies are doing about it. And some of the things that I was already going to talk about are in here. They're talking about, and I don't, again, I don't think it's exclusive to us in law enforcement. I don't even think it's exclusive to employment. This, there's a, a group a generational group right now that most of what we're hiring that three to five years in a location is enough for them and then they move on to another area when i looked at the number of people that have left and the time the average time that they spent with us it was just over five years the people that have left and moved on to other agencies so we're kind of hitting that trend and we're seeing more of it now there's more people that are although I, since i've been here we've had six so I, i'm just under the two a year um Oh, 10, I'm sorry, 10 people that have left. I'm just under the two a year average for Orono at this point. We're seeing that trend though, that there's about three to five years, which I've said this before publicly, and it was said by Captain Scripture, at around five to seven years in Orono in particular, people decide whether they either like dealing with college students or they don't like dealing with college students. And if they don't, they look for other opportunities. And there are other opportunities out there. Particularly now, there is such, unemployment is so low and the economy is so good that if people want a job, they've got one. So the pool has shrunk even more so than when I started. There were, you know, for, for larger agencies like the state police and the warden service, there were hundreds of people that applied. There were 1,800 people that applied many, many, many years ago when I applied for the warden service in 1989. 1,800. I spoke to their current, their new colonel now. They had 30 some odd applications for some for six positions recently. We've we're at three applications right now for our positions that we have currently. And, and normally we're in the eight to 10 range and we're happy when we see that many. So that trend has gone down even even in the 20 years that the, the number of applicants have gone has gone down because they have jobs. And since about 2014, 2015 on, law enforcement hasn't had a great reputation across the country. So fewer people want to do this, that fewer people want this level of scrutiny and judgment on what they do every day. When they can get other jobs that pay equal or more with less stress and, and less danger. Um, and I, I probably Dave could, could speak to this. 
the type of work that we're doing has changed dramatically as well. In the past, it was people from the military and people from families and law enforcement. Those were the, 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 the recruitment pool. But there were so many that wanted to get into this field that were coming either coming out of the military or had families in the military or had law enforcement background in their families. Um, that has dwindled as well. So, so it was it was easy to have a very regimented paramilitary style um, <clears throat> environment to hire people. Now we're asking all those people that had that type of background to do more social service type of work. Um, they're expected to understand how to deal with the mentally ill, particularly the undiagnosed mentally ill, even here in Orono, homelessness and substance abuse. And that is almost our becoming our primary role rather than responding to emergencies and investigations. So it takes a particular type of person to even be able to do that. And it takes a, a skilled, very skilled person to do it well. And at 21, 22, 23 years old, they probably lack those skills. Um, so we're really having to search harder and harder to find that person that is going to be capable of doing that. Or we recruit. We look for someone who's got four or five years in somewhere else that we can say, We've seen what they've done. We see their type of work, and maybe they would fit here in Orono in our style of policing. So we can talk about Orono. Orono is not an easy place to work um, in law enforcement. It is for me. I've been doing it for 20 years. I get it. It's it's second nature to me now. But that, again, 21, 22, 23-year-old kid coming in who had an idea what they thought law enforcement was and was hoping for a little bit of the action a little bit of the enforcement role is asked to do a lot less of that here in Orono and a lot more of the let's mentor people, let's kind of correct behavior, let's see if we can get people to change their behavior and, and understand how to move forward in life rather than here's a ticket, you're going to jail. Some people get that, it, but it takes years for some people to get that. Try to imagine your it's hard to put yourself in, in the shoes of a police officer, trust me. And particularly the police officer that comes into this field. Um, it's just a, it's a completely different outlook to begin with. And then we try to shape that outlook more toward what Orono expects and needs. You know, I've, I've gotten complaints before because an officer didn't wave. Someone waved at him. Most cops in other cities would just, they wouldn't even touch their radar. Uh -huh, radar. It, it just would be so outlandish to hear that, and they wouldn't care. Well, we have to care, and I expect them to care. Um, so we're very similar to national trends. We're seeing that issue. Uh, the the ten thousand dollars over ten over five years is really a drop in the bucket if we can entice someone. We're only let's talk, we're talking about two thousand dollars a year. Um, and when we lose somebody, and we we just did as fresh as they could possibly be out of the academy. We do get reimbursed. The academy just upped that amount, um, and, the, and we're reimbursed for the first five years that, that we've after we put someone through the academy. So, just out of the academy and for that first year, it's forty thousand dollars. We received a forty thousand dollar check today. It doesn't make me feel any better. I'd rather have the person that we trained and, and put the effort into because forty thousand dollars doesn't cover it. Um, you know, that's their salary, the overtime we needed to fill their shifts because they're not working a, a regular shift. We've outfitted them, we've trained them, we've put our love and attention and care into them and, and off they go. So yes. Do you, um, does is the academy training officers for this new kind of paradigm shift? So when they come out of academy, are they looking at more empathy, more compassion as opposed to more law enforcement as well? They are trying to do both. They have 18 weeks to create a person who knows how to stay safe. So you have to teach people to look for every threat that's out there and how to find those threats and how to judge what might be a threat and how to deal with a threat. And we're, teach, we're trying to teach them to be empathetic and compassionate and kind. That's a, it's a tough, there's a, there's a tough balance there. You're, you're hearing, a, particularly because the, the academy on one half, one hand is really watching and seeing officers being ambushed and assaulted and killed across the country more so it seems like it's more so now than it used to be um maybe not in the 70s 70s were really bad but then it got a lot better and it has been better and now we're seeing an uptick of that so the academy really does a as much as they possibly can to train these officers to be paying attention and to be on guard and 
be ready to respond in a moment's notice. Also, can you do that while you're holding people's hands? Tough, but they are working on it. Yes, it is. There's there's much more of an emphasis on it, and there's an emphasis every year now and requirements through the legislature that we get um, a certain number of our officers that are trained in either crisis intervention training, the full week, or the one day mental health first aid. So yes, the answer is yes. It's just still very, very difficult to find that balance. Um, for our recruitment efforts, we, we're going to have to change. And, and again, this is really kind of cool because it's giving me some ideas that were kind of in my head anyway. anyway. We, we try now to go to EMCC because they have a criminal justice program. We go to Huston and we teach. We, have, we take any opportunity that we can to teach either one day classes or full semesters of classes um, and, and then engage with the students and their, some of their um, hands-on practical things that they do. We're always offering to be the agency that does that. So we're seeing, we're getting them exposed to us as much as we can. Um, and then to, to, and when we're retaining people, we're, we, it's, double-edged sword we train people very very well and we send them to very good training then we certify people in a lot of specialties um, that they don't necessarily that most small agencies aren't capable of doing or don't take the time to do the problem is by making them very capable and educated and well-trained officers they're very marketable if they decide they want to go and we can't predict that sometimes <coughs> but I've heard <coughs> other the chief of another agency say <coughs> head of another agency say or no really great people. And we do. So if somebody wants to go, <coughs> go. Because they're going to get a job somewhere else because of how capable and, and how good they are and how they've learned how to deal with anybody. Um, so I will certainly answer questions <coughs> of any kind. Okay. Um, I have a question. I saw somewhere. Um, may have been Pittsburgh. It was a larger area, but you know, it deals with <coughs> some of this concern that we have with um, the need for sort of social <clears throat> services as well, social work. Um, they're actually including, um, they have social work <clears throat> professionals on staff that are going with them on, th in, and that's in probably in a much larger, you know, uh, force in a much larger uh, urban area. But is that, There's <clears throat> is that a trend that's developing somewhere on a, on a smaller level? Bangor attempted that with Acadia Hospital years ago, where they had a one one kind of liaison that would get in and ride with officers, particularly on the evening shifts. And if they had a mental health call, he he was there. I've utilized him the last few years. He works. I think Bangor Police actually pays for his, his position now. I think the funding went away. Uh, I've utilized him many times where we've dealt with someone with clear mental health issues that is that we're not able to help and we're either have had to arrest or don't want to have to arrest and he will he has reached out to them and tried to um, connect them with services through Acadia so and it's been successful a few times and other times it just hasn't been successful because the person won't comply I, that may be a model that works it's the funding that is going to be I mean the state doesn't have enough beds as it is for those people that need help so for us to ask for um, personnel to even less likely I guess but it it's it's a model that's going to have to come because it, that's what we're that's the biggest problem is the mental health issues that are out there and our officers just aren't they are very good at what they do but they're not equipped to be psychologists no for that's sure and, but I just remember seeing that and, and also some of our past discussions and presentations is is something that there's a need for it but I just didn't know to what level that's even a possibility absolute need maybe it'll come Anyone else have any questions or comments? I just want to say that, um, I mean, every community is different. Orno is its own unique kind of community. There's really a heavy emphasis here on community policing. Um, it's probably not a good fit for everyone. And I, I, I like that we have <clears throat> this opportunity to, um, to put a bonus out there to attract the, the kind of officers that would really sort of be at home in this very particular kind of community. So um, it does, I mean, in theory, ends up saving us some money, even though some of those costs are not tangible. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's always sad to lose people. But, um, you know, as you're pointing out, it's part of a, a national trend anyway. 
And also we, we want, you know, we want the people who really like this particular kind of work in this kind of community, so. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, well, I'd just add that I think this process makes um, the urinal position much more attractive to a, an experienced officer. And I think that has some real benefits and we, we can, we'll have a history of how that experienced officer has, has worked in another community. And there's real advantage to that. Great. All right, I will take a vote on order 20-15. All those in favor? Passes unanimously. I have a feeling you've got the next one too. I do. Order 20-16, order authorizing the town manager to enter into an agreement with Penobscot County for regional animal control <coughs> services for one year beginning January 1, 2020 to December 31, 2020. I'll take a motion please. Second. <laughs> <laughs> so we've contracted the last few years with Penobscot County and um, several <coughs> agencies in the area do so. It's been successful for us. Um, we've had excellent service from the animal control officer when we've needed her. The, the model is that our officers respond initially to whatever the animal complaint is and they assess whether they can manage it themselves. So many times it's bringing a dog back to the station putting his picture on Facebook, loving it, and then we wait for someone to call or we check our, our license registration book to see who owns it. If not, the dog or cat at times will go to the animal orphanage in Old Town and, and it'll stay there until its owner is found or it's um, adopted out. Um, this last year, I can see that we did about 130 animal complaints that were handled. The officers handled roughly 100 of those with about 30 that the animal control officer did. And sometimes it'll be 30 calls, but the animal control officer will manage that four or five times having to go back to either trap an animal or um, go back to deal with an owner with a, a dog bite or something like that. So the, the officers are still doing the vast majority of these calls. Again, one of those little things that's different about Orna, we really expect our officers to kind of make as much effort as they can unless they're too busy to deal with even a cat. Um, so. I think we save a lot of money just simply by the officers managing these calls themselves. And just to clarify for folks who are not used to this, that um, under state law, we must have a certified animal control officer. This is not a, it's nice. This is a, either we contract with, with somebody else or we have to train somebody on staff and uh, Josh has zero interest in yeah, having to do, do it, but I'm not going to let her. No, so. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a lot of training and a lot of recertification to do that job. Um, Josh, do you have any idea how much we spent last year? Well, the contract itself is seven sixty five or 7,000 a year. The, the way I read it, it was based on an hourly rate. So oh, it was... uh, it, I think we budget maybe 2,000, 2,200. Okay. Yeah. And we don't go over that. Okay. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I was going to actually say, I actually see your employee um, on TV in the morning. Isn't she with the Old, old Town Rescue Mission or something for animals? It's the, yeah, it's Jessica Mason, the administrative assistant. Yeah. She works with the Florida Rescue. Right. So, so I, I yeah, typically see her on TV every morning. So she fosters dogs, and then that's one of the yeah. things she does, and she tries to help get them placed. Yeah, they're good people. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, I will take a vote on order 20-16. All those in favor? Passes unanimously. Thanks, Josh. Um, order 20-17, order authorizing the town manager to send a notice of default to Webster Point LLC, declaring an event of default and terminating the Webster Point Credit Enhancement Agreement. I'll take a motion, please. Move, Move approval. approval. Second. All right. Who wants to do this? Dave and I are trying to flip the coin I right noticed. now. <laughs> um, are you are you prepared for this one? Uh, I'm I, prepared to have the, the conversation. Okay. Then um, I'll turn off my mic and let you go for it. Uh, Dave Milan, the director of community development, and I oversee the the one of the joys I get is to oversee the TIF program, tax incremental financing district. Um, and this is a, a, a 
a case where um, our assessor was was notified by um, the owners of the of the development for the Webster Point. Um, it was a, an affordable housing um, TIF district that he was um, not interested in continuing uh, to build the final six um, uh, dwellings um, of the 14 total. So eight were, were created, six uh, were still remaining. Um, and he had been trying to uh, to make it work and uh, decided that he was he was from southern Maine it was trying hard to do it from from southern Maine to uh, to work up here so he decided to in essence kind of walk away from his development and take his take his licks and and uh, and move on so the question became um, is that with the with his uh, and I'm just using the legal term so it may sound worse than it is but the abandonment of the of the project um, the question becomes is that whether the TIF is, uh, excuse me, the credit enhancement agreement is, uh, uh, you know, is still viable. And, and so uh, we reached out to um, our attorney who we deal with um, for credit enhancement agreements, TIFs and such, um, kind of got the answer that we thought we were going to get. And that is, is that, um, you know, from walking away with that, Walking away from the credit enhancement agreement would, uh, you know, would default the, the the developer for the the benefits of that uh, credit enhancement agreement, and so the process would be that the council would need to would have to consider um, finding um, that person, the the developer, um, in default, um, so that the uh, credit enhancement agreement would be. Um, would in essence go away, um, and it's a as I keep telling. Uh, so that's a policy decision. That's not a staff decision. Um, you want to take it from there. So the question in front of council right now is: When you entered into this credit enhancement agreement with Webster Point LLC, you did so with the premise that they were going to construct fourteen dwelling units with so a certain. So the can I just, where is this web? Is this the one on the end of yeah, North Main? Where, where, where um, Stryer's no, right, used it, to be? It was before my time, so I was just making sure I knew. My first week on the job, I got to see part of it demoed. So, um, The mill, so, not the uh, development. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you entered into this agreement based on this envisioned project. We are sheltering 100% of the increment of value gained from this um, project. 85% of that under the credit enhancement agreement goes back to the developer. That right now is approximately $36,000, $37,000 a year. So when the assessor received this notice of abandonment, which is a formal process that they do through the Registry of Deeds, which puts everybody on notice that they're not going to construct any more of the project, um, that hit my desk because the question now is, is he fulfilling, is the developer fulfilling the obligation under the credit enhancement agreement? As written right now, by the word, no. But it is up to the town council to determine whether or not it wants to send a notice of default. So what you would, if you voted yes on this order, what you'd be saying is, yep, you, this is a default. We have no interest in continuing to, to give you any of the taxes that are paid back. Um, you're putting them on notice that you think it's a uh, event of default. Um, that gives him an opportunity, 30 days, to cure it or to give us a good argument why it's not. Um, at the end of 30 days, if we didn't see a cure, um, we would then terminate the credit enhancement agreement. This is not something that is cut and dry. This is not a... He didn't follow the letter, therefore we must. This is truly a policy decision for the town council to consider. I, 
How many more years are there in the agreement? 2027, I believe, is the, the end of it. Can he sell these development rights to anyone else? Not now because he's abandoned them. So it's it, because it's a condominium association. Um, the when he filed that, um, as the attorney, our attorney has informed me, when he filed that um, uh, abandonment, the, the the property that was left becomes the the ownership of the condominium association. So so no further development can occur. Is okay. what not by him. Or, or not through him. Right, but the condo association could? They could, but your credit enhancement agreement does not automatically flow with the land. You would have to. So, for example, um, as I understand it, if the condo association said, oh, we really want to get 85% of our taxes back and it's worth us developing the last eight, six, last six dwellings, um, they could come to you and ask to enter into a credit enhancement agreement with the town council. So it doesn't foreclose future action. It just means when this developer, because the other thing to remember is this developer is getting everybody else's taxes back. They're not, it's not like he's paying the tax and getting it back, which is what most of our credit enhancement agreements are. Um, so this is everybody else when they pay their tax bill Get, they get, um, they're getting a portion of their taxes back that they actually paid. He's getting a portion of the people who own the property's taxes back. And, and how, many of the, how many of those units are occupied right now? Uh, all, eight. all eight. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Sophie, can you um, just talk a little bit in practical terms about the, about what happens <clears throat> um, one way or the other. What I mean, so I mean, like I understand uh, the overview, but just sort of on, on the ground in practical terms, what what is the result of the yes or the no in terms of default? So um, one of the questions that we're still trying to get answered and have not been able to get a satisfactory answer on is whether or not this abandonment is going to um, create any problems with the underlying TIF district. Um, that TIF district is a unique district. There aren't very many of them in the state as an affordable housing TIF. We're not sure. We knew that there was a percentage. We don't know if there's a minimum number of affordable um, dwellings that had to be constructed over time. So. Dave is still trying to get that answer. Um, but a yes, most simply, um, a yes means that um, after this last round of payments, um, the town would not have any obligation to give um, any money back to the developer. When you look out at what happened with the Envision Net TIF, there was a credit enhancement agreement that went with that. Um, with the original owner of record. Um, when that owner walked away, the town declared a default and terminated the agreement and has always held that in the back pocket. If, if somebody, if Dave needs to bring somebody in, that isn't allowed use within that TIF district and we could potentially use some of that. But right now we, we don't and instead we use it for economic development expenses and um, all the lights that happened on Godfrey um, were funded through that. So infrastructure. The interesting piece of the affordable housing TIF is that it allows up to 15% um, to be used of the, the development program funds to be used to offset educational expenses. So um, that's a unique kind of um, feature. So to say, we don't want to do anything now doesn't say that in the future you can't declare a default but um, it means that when everybody pays their tax bill we're going to be cutting a check back to the developer um, and 
the only the state might overrule us in terms of whether or not this still meets the criteria for an affordable housing TIF, and which point the credit enhancement agreement would be moot. Helpful? Okay. This wouldn't necessarily impact the residents. Can I add one thing? The, the affordable housing um, TIF requires that 25% of the of the uh, units that are built um, be sold to folks who meet a certain um, uh, income requirement. Um, we report, I report on that to the state, to the main, main housing annually. Um, it, because it's uh, eight units, um, they, two of them have to be, you know, in, in as uh, affordable housing for 10 years. So the only point I want to make is those that would have that would stay if, from what uh, our attorney is telling us. Those will have that requirement will stay for that ten years. Um, one of them has sold, uh, and, but it had to sell to another person who met that requirement, and they will have to continue for the balance of that ten years. I think that ten years will expire in twenty four or five. Uh, so to answer Sam's question, I cannot see a way that whether or not we give this developer who has abandoned, given notice that he's abandoned the development, future tax payments will impact the people who are so there. He wasn't passing that back to them or anything. Right? Not that I'm aware of, no. but that. No, that the agreement was is that, I mean, he, he paid a, a tremendous amount of uh, money to do all, put all the infrastructure in there um, as part of this project. And that was the plan um, from the beginning was that he would be getting paid back over time um, basically what he's saying is I'm cutting my losses and moving on. I think if you don't vote to abandon the credit enhancement agreement, then staff will simply focus with the town attorney on is the underlying TIF district going to be okay. If you do vote, then staff will be focusing with town attorney on that last question, plus uh, Dave and I will be talking at length with Kyle and um, Rob Yerksa and Joe Madigan about um, infrastructure. Were there upgrades to infrastructure that were considered when this TIF district was put together? Because that would be a reason that we would want to continue to shelter money if we're trying to save up for a for a um, a project. You know, right now we've got thirty. Six thousand, thirty-seven thousand dollars in that account. Do you anticipate any pushback from the developer? Question. I I wanted to wait to uh, we to to reach out. To, my plan was is that once I found out what the wishes of the council were, I'd reach out to them. Um, I'm not. I don't. I, I don't think I want to answer that yet. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is he has thirty days to, uh, as Sophie explained. Um, earlier, his 30 days to, to either. Um, so the one thing I, I would say, Cheryl, is that the crediting, the credit enhancement agreement doesn't just say for this project that you're going to do down here to develop some residential. It is explicit what that was supposed to be developed. He filed a notice of abandonment. The reason that the town got it is because it came through the assessor's Correct. office. So um, my sense at this point is I wanted to see where council was heading um, <clears throat> because I, my guess, he's a pretty astute developer. This is not his first rodeo. Um, my sense is he has to have an idea that he is at least in violation. And I wouldn't doubt that one response that could come back is, okay, I haven't done the whole project. Can we sit down and talk about how we might amend the credit enhancement agreement. And I, I, I think Dave and I would kind of expect that and expect to try to bring you back, uh, you know, soften him up to understand what might be a, a good compromise. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, we ought to recognize that the developer took a significant town liability and turned it into something that's reasonably attractive and producing some taxes. And I'm, I'm saddened that he is not able to complete the, 
the project, but that's the the economics of it. It's just not working for them. Um, so I have some sympathy for the developer. Um, having said that, I, I can't think of a good reason why we would not want to um, provide a notice of default. I, you know, I think I think that's not the end of the story. Um, that provides him with an opportunity to come back to us and and, and try to negotiate something else, possibly. Um, and, and we may hear more from him. So. I, I want to hear from a real estate attorney that would say what our rights are. I mean, this is a complicated agreement. And it, I guess I haven't heard from you that we could definitely, I mean, what happens if we say, okay, we're not giving you that money because you defaulted. And he says, well, <coughs> the fine print says, even if I defaulted, I made the investment, you still need to give me the money. No, what we're coming here telling you is that we've talked to somebody who specializes in tax increment financing districts and credit enhancement agreements. This is pretty much what Shauna Cook Mueller does. And what she's telling us after having looked at the notice of abandonment that we received and the credit enhancement agreement, which lays out as uh, an event that can create a default la failure to complete the project, which is what we are saying is happening. So I don't I don't know, Lori. There are times, oftentimes, that I come and channel what I have been told by town attorneys. This is one of those times. Um, go ahead, Tom. I, 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 I'm ready to vote on this motion. I don't, I don't know whether other folks are ready. I absolutely. Okay. So there, there is a motion on the floor. There is a motion. Yep. I was just going to add that I do remember when we got into this um, at the first time, it, it, there was a lot of infrastructure that was had to go into place, I believe a new pump station, and mm -hmm. there, was, there was a lot that, that he was gonna outlay for, so, uh, but um, I will take a vote on order 20-17, all those in favor of the notice of default. Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you very much, thanks. Thank you for the discussion. Um, we are going to go to the order that was put on, um, order 2018, order authorizing the town manager in consultation with the town planner, director of public works and engineering, and the town engineer to negotiate and execute utility easements, including those for drainage on town-owned property adjacent to RSU 26 property, as needed to facilitate planned renovation and construction at the Orono schools, so long as pursuant to ordinance section 2-150C4, said easements do not unreasonably burden or unduly neg negatively impact the use of town or abutting properties, and further to authorize the town manager to negotiate and execute a memorandum of understanding with RSU 26 if required by a permitting agency confirming the town's intent to provide easements. I'll take a motion and I want that read back. <laughs> so moved. Second. All right. So Kyle, I'm gonna start. All right. So um, council is well aware that um, the RSU is getting ready to do some pretty major renovations. And um, we have been working with them through the planning process here. So Rob Yarksa and um, Kyle have, I think, worked extensively with the school. What we have handed you is the um, town, it's a picture, a map of um, the Asa Adams School primarily in the high school. And you see two red circles. You'll notice that if you can get rid of the white little grid lines on the map, there are some thicker yeah, um, white lines that indicate property lines. And what you'll notice are two red circles. The one on the left, um, as you look at this, up near the town pool, and the one on the right, um, in between Asa Adams and the high school near the sliding hill. So what has happened as the school has walked through their process, 
they um, have learned that they're going to have to um, design um, in a, a project that deals with stormwater um, quality and quantities that actually exceed this project. It dates back to uh, a prior project that was done um, that um, they didn't have to, they didn't get a permit for, I think was the issue. So what you're going to see on the face of the earth is going to look a little bit bigger than what you would anticipate for a project of this size. That said, they were like doing gymnastics to try to get all of the drainage on the RSU property. It doesn't really make sense because when you look at the infrastructure that was laid out for the school and the town, it was done when the school and the town, this was all one big piece of property. So instead of putting um, drainage ponds in, in a way that takes out the um, demonstration educational um, tree garden that the tree board has been working with the school on for a long time, um, or really uses up space that doesn't make sense. Um, we reached out to the superintendent and just made sure that they were aware that if we could, if they could give us places um, that would make more sense on the face of the earth, even if they extended beyond the lot lines, that I was quite sure that the town council wouldn't have a problem um, granting some drainage easements here. They are looking at um, doing a combination of tying into existing drainage infrastructure and detention ponds. So um, it is actually the um, circle over by the pool that quite honestly Rob is most interested in um, looking at. He thinks it makes the most sense from a site perspective. And it will allow the water to drain into an existing wet area that is there for the purpose of moving water. Um, but in either case, we think we can facilitate drainage easements in either of those areas um, in a way that would not impact current use. People would be able to continue to use the sliding hill if it was over there. People would be able to continue to use those areas by the pool, St. Mary's Field. Um, and um, we think that overall it makes more sense to kind of leave it up in the air a little bit to allow the school's um, consultants to work with staff, staff being um, the town planner, Rob, and Mandy Oliver, the town engineer, to come up with something that we can say would not negatively impact the town, the use of these town properties or a butters. And we think we think we can do that. What I'm asking for is the flexibility to be able to do that without having to stop what they're doing to come back to council for a specific easement. Is that? Um, Sophie, what's our kind of liability or will we address that? Oh, we will address that in the easement. And the answer at the end of the day is that with any type of construction like this where you're looking at an easement, the expectation is they are going we are going to agree with what they're going to construct. And um, when they're done, it's going to be put back as much to the way it, it was before as possible, meaning if they have to take out a bunch of trees, they're going to clean up their mess. Um, and they are going to want the ability to maintain that easement. I'm going to want um, any um, future construction to be done to where they have to bring it back to existing conditions and if they do damage that they have to fix that it, it you see that in that language in our easements that we have with people for town infrastructure and i would expect the same thing and i i kind of expect that they are expecting that and i just got a nod from the chair of the <laughs> <laughs> But Sophie, it's it's either one or the other. It's not both, right? It's the it's not 
the two red circles. It's the one. As I understand, it's one or the other. And those, I just, those are areas, general areas. They are still doing their due diligence research design to figure out where it makes the best sense to be. Um, either way, um, talking with Rob and Mitch, both, and Kyle, I think it's doable and I think it makes more sense for the project if we allow them to construct it and give them an easement. Um, I would uh, propose that we do the easement the way we did it with UCU though, which if the um, permitting agencies require an MOU saying that we're gonna agree on uh, an easement, um, that we, that we do that and then hold an actual easement until um, after construction because that allows us the appropriate, we do it based on an as-built. The MOU gives us the, the that they're gonna put everything back the way they found it with the exception of what we agree on. So that would be my thought. However, if they want something very specific and then they're willing to live with live with that or pay to have it changed. I'm all, uh, I'm fine with that too. Uh, is there, any, there's nothing that has to happen with ASA, so nothing lower than those two? Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I will just add that uh, I was sledding in the area of the top circle with my daughter last weekend and she scoped out a secret fort that falls right within that red circle. So if something happens there and there's any fallout, I'm gonna deny I was involved. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, 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 I would just comment that I think this uh, order makes perfect sense and um, it's nice that we can help facilitate a very exciting school project. Brian, do you want to add anything? Bef no, I appreciate the council's consideration. Um, as Sophie said, I think it's general at the moment, but my understanding from the engineer is the most likely spot is still Anyone else have any questions? I just, I just agree. I think just sort of flexibility and cooperation is important. This is a huge benefit to this community, and I, I think it's great that we can help out in, in, in yet another way. Yeah. Um, my only concern is just being near the school that if it's an attractive, if it's a big pond, that I would hope that we would take some safety measures to keep mm -hmm. kids out of it. That's been part of the planning board discussion so far, because that was a concern with the original proposed location as well. So I think either way, that's going to be something identified through the site plan process. Great, I'm glad great minds think alike. <laughs> um, if no one else has any other comments, I will take a vote on order 2018. All those in favor, passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for all your work on that. Um, we'll move on to council committee and representative reports. Sam, I'll start down with you. Sure, thank you. Um, Community Development Committee met on December 19th. We had a couple items on the agenda. We were looking at land use ordinance uh, revisions related to fraternity and sorority use, mostly where we had um, fraternities when they were not fully, um, when they had vacancy due to uh, summer break, that sort of thing, they were perhaps using some renting things. There was some uh, cleaning up that needed to be done on that sort of um, usage. And, that, um, and I think that clarification, are we getting clarification with you, Main? My job is to take everything we talked about and ship it over to campus and let them distribute it, they'll give me some initial feedback, which should be positive because we did our feet, we asked the questions before we came to council. And then um, we'll bring it back when we've heard and see what you think. So yes, so that's happening. I don't know exactly when that's gonna happen in the next couple months. 
Doesn't so matter. It's, I was told funny. that I didn't have to race because everybody was on break. So sure. now that we've got one week left, I'm going to be racing. Okay. The other item was land use ordinance related to excavation and filling of land that was generated by a uh, project that happened down Main Street a little bit. And we have, uh, we talked about that and a draft is actually being uh, crafted and will be presented at our next meeting, which is Thursday, this coming Thursday. That's it. Okay. Lori, do you have anything? No. Nope. Tom? Uh, no, I do not have a report tonight. Uh, finance committee meets a week from tomorrow. Okay. Megan? Yes, I have two. Um, the Comp Plan Implementation Committee met on January 6th. We had one major area of discussion, which was to review uh, and discuss um, a proposed update to the existing Code of Ordinances, Chapter 14, Fire Prevention and Protection. So we heard from uh, Chief Lowe that night about some updates to that code um, that would uh, just basically be for increased safety purposes. One piece that uh, we ended up talking a bit about had to do with rooming and rental unit inspections, and that's something that we're trying to figure out how it ties into a larger conversation we're having about uh, rental properties. So uh, that conversation is ongoing. And then the Orono Historical Society met on January 7th, and uh, we talked quite a bit about um, the Historical Society's involvement in the upcoming bicentennial celebration that the town will be having on March 14th, uh, 2020, um, and various ways that they're going to be involved. Um, we also were talking about um, a membership drive at the event, but just in case, this is the time of year that they typically collect membership dues. So for the very low price of $10, or I think it's 20 uh, ten dollars for an individual, twenty four or twenty five for a family. You could donate to a very worthy cause. Um, you may wonder, well, what do they collect money for? And mostly, what they use it on is to preserve and promote Orono's history. So, you don't even have to come to the meetings. You can just, you know, sign up for a membership and and do a good deed for the community. Um, and Terry will probably have more to say about the bicentennial. So I'll stop there. Cheryl, I think. Terry? Well, we, we do have a lot going on in the bicentennial celebration, kind of just kind of getting geared up to um, kind of hit deadlines to get grants uh, written um, to, to, to get monies to, to apply to this. Um, I ask community kind of just keep your, your uh, eyes open and check frequently. Um, we're going to have a, um, on the town's website, we'll have a location specifically geared toward um, any informations that pertain to the celebration. Um, we're kind of in the middle of a lot of what's going on. Um, we, we've decided to set up pods for um, uh, different things. So if you have a, an idea um, that you'd like to contribute to this celebration, um, please let the town uh, Dave and Mitch know that um, they'll they'll help you uh, through um, what it would what what it would entail for them to actually set those up. Um, we did find out that the University of Maine has got a pod set up uh, confirmed now um, for the hist for their history project. Um, um, let me see what else. We are also going to be looking for many many volunteers. So um, if if you're out there and you want to contribute to um, helping at any level, whether it be moving stuff or just being a body um, through the process, please let us know. Um, but just please keep your eyes open um, and look at the website and uh, see as we keep adding more information. Is there a month or a season, or is it the whole year that you're doing things? It actually does pertain to the whole year. I know that we're right now we're kind of like geared to just focusing for part of it for that the March celebration. However, um, there are I, I believe there's a project that's going going to be going on with where which is going to actually take the entire year, and within those grant monies and stuff, the, you you have the entire year to to do stuff. So if you have an idea. Of a, of, a, of a birthday celebration of some kind or historical sinus celebration, um, whether it be Orono or the state, um, it could be held in the summertime. So if you've got any great ideas, we'll, we're looking to have a good year of celebration. So please bring those to us. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to future agenda items, items of concern. We'll go right back to you, Terry. Do you have any? 
Okay. Cheryl, no. yeah. Megan, Tom, Lori, Sam. All right. Public petitions. I don't think we have any public comments. Susan. Susan Whitmore. So I'm shopping for a new mic head. It's amazing every time someone makes use of the word pods. You know, I just think in the scope of design, that word must have an interesting history. Though I speak at the moment um, with some information people might find of interest, especially though it's involved in investing and such. Um, recent reports mentioning that uh, gold prices, there's predictions that hypothesizing that those are going to soon increase. And as for modern gold history, gold production, actually, currently gold is being mined in terms of people are extracting gold from the planet via a shaft that is 10 miles below the surface of the earth. After a person travels 10 miles from the surface of the earth, they then have to travel about one half mile through a tunnel held up literally by two by fours to the explosion site. Interesting, right? That, that's a labor effort. So I recently met a person that informed me of some creative projects that have been occurring amongst the glass craft people of Maine. You know, it's really interesting to see the paraphernalia bong slots produced with gold inclusions. Way to make use of global resources. You know, I just imagine the powwows, very lavash and luxurious, must have some really meaty, humanitarian discussions to dig into. Hmm. So I just think that's an interesting tidbit about the Thank mining you. of gold. Thank and you very much. where that gold, where those resources are going. Whether or not gold can actually be extracted from fused glass, not entirely certain. I'm inclined to think that that gold would just sizzle. Hmm. Thank you, Susan. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, we have an executive session coming up. Uh, and so there will be no further council action after that executive <laughs> session. So nobody really needs to hang around for that. Um, so I will take a motion pursuant to 1 MRSA section 4056D to discuss collective bargaining negotiations with Maine Association of Police Orno Unit. Um, could I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Passes unanimously. We are now going into executive session. Thank you very much. Wait, is this? Are we, we can't all fit if we do it this way, right? Oh, yeah. Maybe you can, like, 